The Last of Us 2 is going to go down as one of the most divisive games of all time. Some people hate it, some people love it, and way too many people form their opinions on it without really giving it a shot. Me, I'm somewhere in the middle. As a whole, this game isn't as bad as people are saying, but it also isn't as good either. That may seem like an oxymoron cop-out, but it's true. I've seen very few people say it's average or that it's just okay. It's either as good or better than Part 1, or it's one of the worst games they've been unlucky enough to even lay eyes on. In a weird way, that's how the game is formatted though. It has very high highs and extremely low lows. It really is an all or nothing kind of experience. I don't know if I'd encourage people to pay 60 bucks for it, but in a weird way I do still encourage people to give this a shot and form their own opinions. My first playthrough, I hated it, and that was an opinion entirely formed on the story, pacing, characters, and writing. The gameplay and visuals do deserve some recognition, but don't get me wrong, the storyline in this game is piss poor. I never really got angry or upset about this in a way that a lot of people did. For me, this game was more disappointing than anything else. There were some really good ideas in place, but when it came time to execute them, they went over about as well as purposely shitting your pants in church would. Part 1 was one of my favorite games of all time. Hell, it's been forever since I made a video like this, and the last one that I made was an unfinished series looking at why Joel was a selfish asshole, but also a fantastically written character at the same time. The nuance and detail that was put into Part 1's story and into those characters was one of the best I've ever seen. That goes for video games, TV, movies, whatever. So, here's your obligatory spoiler warning for Parts 1 and 2, and a spoiler warning for the audience's own triggerisms that this game seems to bring out of everyone. I'm going to be making my own criticisms, as well as addressing the biggest issues I've seen the last couple months. People that love this game aren't going to like a lot of the things I have to say. However, people who hate this game aren't going to like some of the things that I have to say either. I think that's why this game fascinates me so much. I can't think of any entertainment medium being so divided that brings so many emotions out of people, the good and the bad. The majority of this video is going to be my criticisms about the game and why Part 1 worked and Part 2 didn't. It's really weird though, I can't bring myself to say that I disliked this game, but I also can't let myself say that it's good. As I said, it's disappointing. Part 2 could have been so much better, but after doing a few rewrites of this video and playing through the game again, I can at least see where Neil Druckmann and the creators were coming from. Part 2 was going to have huge shoes to fill, and in hindsight, the writing was on the wall very early on that things weren't going to go according to plan. Before the leaks even came out, there were already rumbles about this game pandering towards SJWs, feminism, and trying too hard to involve LBGTQ characters. The fact that people were arguing over this was kind of ridiculous. We already knew that Ellie was a lesbian, and we met another gay character as well in Bill. Ellie wasn't just a lesbian character, she was a character that was a lesbian. Bill wasn't just a gay character, he was a character that was gay. Neither of them were defined by their sexuality, and I thought they were written very well in that regard. It was their personalities and traits that shined through, and who they were taking to bed was an afterthought. Unless they put an obvious, over-the-top style character like Terry from Reno 911 in as a main character, this was just people overreacting. Another big rumor was that Anita Sarkeesian influenced this game and was the reason for any kind of SJW agenda. I get why the internet hates her, but I don't buy into the conspiracy theories. Google the 2013 IGDA Toronto Keynote. Neil Druckmann gives a long speech talking about the development process of The Last of Us Part 1 and already altering specific plot points because he thought they were too misogynistic. He also mentions Feminist Frequency, which is Anita's YouTube channel slash show thing, and this is in production of Part 1. Neil Druckmann was already talking about changing these topics long before Part 2 was written, let alone even greenlit. He had the same quote-unquote feminist thoughts for Part 1, the game we all loved, as he did for Part 2, the game most of us hated. Anita herself had nothing to do with The Last of Us Part 2. She's just such a lightning rod of internet negativity that people immediately talk shit on this game because they thought she had some kind of involvement. People will definitely be pissed I kinda defended Anita Sarkeesian, but fair is fair. Doing research for this video and the conspiracy theories around Druckmann and Sarkeesian, I even listened to her podcast on The Last of Us 2. Not the easiest listen, but again, fair is fair, 
and she criticizes a lot of the same things that the general internet population has. Things like Ellie's reverse character progression. Said, quote, fuck this game when talking about the ending. Says the runtime is unnecessarily long and repeatedly rips the game for using violence as its way to convey a violence is bad message. While everything she said wasn't negative, after listening to the podcast, she definitely didn't sound like someone that had any say or input in the final version of this game. Because people want to hate her so much, they aren't looking at the information that's directly in front of them, which is everything else Neil Druckmann mentions during that speech that isn't feminist frequency. If you're interested in it, I strongly suggest listening to that 2013 speech I mentioned. If you just want the highlights, I will be bringing up parts of it at different points in this video. But back on subject, the more concrete and concerning part leading up to the release was the treatment of Naughty Dog employees. This wasn't anything new. News and rumors of their crunch periods along with overworked and unhappy staff had been around for years. Not saying it's right, but the majority of people look the other way because of the quality of Naughty Dog's games. If you're putting out good content, then your consumers are much more likely to turn a blind eye to how it's made. It's literally all over the consumer world from cell phones to shoes. Only difference is it's 2020, phones and shoes are essential parts of your day for the majority of people. Naughty Dog video games are not. People were starting to notice and grumble about these working conditions a bit more though. The fact that this was happening at a big time game developer and not in a sweatshop was really starting to upset people. Then of course we had the infamous leaks. Originally thought to have been leaked by a disgruntled employee, Sony has come out and said that they were hacked. Could be the truth, could be Sony trying to cover up for one of their big money makers. We'll probably never know. Personally, I kind of feel like this was Sony doing some damage control for a cash cow. What we did know for sure was that these leaks infuriated a lot of the fan base. Naughty Dog and Sony then waged war against the internet trying to silence and copyright strike anyone reporting on them, further upsetting a fan base that was already very upset. All of these issues were leading to a worst case scenario situation and the game was still months away from release. Couple all this negativity and bad publicity with people being angry at all the real world issues of the pandemic and racial injustices, this game was fighting an uphill battle before it was even released. Then finally the day came. After all this bullshit and delays, all this could be wiped away and forgotten if Naughty Dog delivered a great game. This game looks as good as anything else on the PS4 and plays like an updated version of Part 1. The problem is, graphics and gameplay are not the calling card in a game like this. The time you spend in actual enemy encounters makes up, off the top of my head, a third of the game, maybe? But chances are it's significantly less time than that. The most important parts are the story and characters, which I said earlier, just aren't good. Originally I had a whole separate video planned, almost fully finished actually. It was about 42 and a half minutes of me just bashing this game from all angles while being condescending and shitty about it. There's countless videos and articles doing the exact same thing already, so when I got close to being done, it felt kind of pointless to release, even though I felt strongly about my opinions and criticisms. Say what you will about Neil Druckmann, but he was very open in saying that this isn't supposed to be a 100% fun game. They fully intended that players would hate Abby. They wanted players to feel the same feelings that Ellie was. They didn't want people to be happy when they returned to this bleak and unforgiving world. In a weird way, they didn't want players to enjoy what they were experiencing. As I was playing through a second time to fine tune my arguments and get the gameplay capture, I kept saying to myself, what the fuck made them think any of those ideas were good? Why would you want to force unpleasant feelings on your audience? Why would you possibly think that was a good idea? Well, when the barometric pressure reaches a certain temperature, st shit, I don't fucking know. That answer is hidden in plain sight. Neil Druckmann and Naughty Dog have already done it to us before, and it was a huge success. They did it to us in The Last of Us Part 1. The Last of Us Part 1 shouldn't have worked, let alone been recognized as one of the best video games ever made. It did everything backwards from the popular norms of the time. Open world was seemingly the new standard, and if you weren't open world, then you better deliver unique plot choices and multiple endings. The 3DS had a resurgence, mobile games were taking over, and not to mention that a lot of younger players couldn't give two shits about the narrative of a console game as long as the graphics looked good. The Last of Us Part 1 went out and did the opposite. Naughty Dog had a story to tell and the player was going to get no say in how that story was told. 
it didn't matter what players wanted to do. Joel and Ellie's story was extremely linear, and all you got to do was form your opinions around their journey. Was Joel a hero or a villain? Were the Fireflies liberators or terrorists? Should Ellie have been sacrificed for the vaccine? Was humanity too far gone to even save at this point? They wanted to make you question yourself and your beliefs. Most importantly, make you wonder just what were you capable of in order to save a loved one. When Ellie breaks down and tells Joel that he's all she has and Joel turns her down, you're supposed to feel the same sadness and disappointment that Ellie does. She's giving her monologue and the comforting music is playing. You expect Joel to have a change of heart, but he goes all in in the opposite direction and says they're done. You've spent the last 8-10 to 10 hours playing as Joel, and you're supposed to go, Ah, fuck you dude, what was that all about? Later when Joel changes his mind, you're then supposed to have the same little smile on your face that Ellie does in the cutscene. It's a game that plays with your emotions, and they expect you to not just watch the story unfold, but share some of the same feelings that the characters do. Even though Joel keeps Ellie safe, he's still an extremely violent murderer who's also keeping Ellie safe for his own very selfish reasons. Naughty Dog wanted you to be uncomfortable when you find yourself rooting for a character like that to succeed. Part 1 is an equally miserable and brutal fucking game. Ellie helps keep things more lighthearted, but anytime there's a quick feel-good moment, you're dragged right back into the shit almost immediately. Outside of the first bloater, there aren't really boss fights either, just encounters with higher numbers of enemies coming at you. The final encounters don't differ much from the rest of the gameplay, and you don't even need to actually kill any of them. Then there's that whole abrupt ending. Sure, Ellie's alive, but in a weird way, is that what everyone wants? Hell, it's not even what Ellie wants. And now that she's alive, the game ends with Joel lying and Ellie clearly knowing that he's lying. She has no choice other than to convince herself that this lie is the truth. Joel then has no choice except convincing himself that Ellie somehow believes this lie when he knows that she doesn't. Their whole relationship going forward is now based off of lies and compromise. The ending wasn't meant to make players feel good. It shouldn't have worked, but instead became one of gaming's most memorable endings. The success of Part 1 had to have influenced the against the grain ideas in Part 2. They just flat out didn't do it as well this time. On a side note, because I don't really know where else to quickly add this, Google the marketing for The Last of Us Part 1. Druckmann laughs off how they purposely lied and told people you never play as Ellie, and cut a trailer together with the intentions of making the player believe that Ellie would eventually have to kill an infected Joel. While it's nowhere near as egregious as the marketing for Part 2, Naughty Dog has purposely lied before the release of their games. Is this as big of a lie as trying to hide Abby? No. But it's not like they've never done it before either. When I stopped being disappointed in Part 2 for long enough to really think about it, I did enjoy my second playthrough more. It didn't change any of the terrible plot elements, but I at least acknowledged where the writers were coming from. I understood why they did the things they did, and why they thought it would elicit certain reactions from their audience. With that said, it's still a swing and a big fucking miss in part two. Honestly, I think they had some really good ideas in place that could have made another great game, but they faceplanted in their execution of these ideas. With the longest intro ever out of the way, for this video, I want to try and break down why the plot doesn't work this time around. Unfortunately, Naughty Dog made it very easy to just point and laugh at a lot of the shit in this game, but I'm going to try and not be too obnoxious in my criticisms here. Whether people who watch this agree or disagree, I at least hope that most people can go, ah, okay, I see where you're coming from. See, there's a sequel. It wasn't as good. First off, let's just get the elephant in the room out of the way, and that's Joel's death. I managed to keep myself spoiler-free from the leaks when I first played this game, but I knew that Joel was going to die at some point. Clearly, I'm not an author or a filmmaker. I'm just an asshole with a word processor program and a microphone, but Joel's death was just natural progression in a story that's now focused on other characters. Characters whose motives are in response to Joel's actions. I don't understand how anyone who played the first game couldn't anticipate it happening. In 2013, when people reviewed this game and talked about a possible sequel down the road, everyone was saying that Joel's actions would come back to haunt him. The second teaser for the game came out at the end of 2016, and that all but spelled out Joel's death as well. Fans immediately, and correctly, guessed that Joel was dead and the people Ellie said she was going to find and kill were in fact Joel's killers. It's why later trailers had the fake scenes of an aged-up Joel. 
Leading up to release, creators said time and time again that this game was about hate and revenge. Joel's death was not so subtly foreshadowed for years. People who got mad just because Joel died are being unreasonable and childish. What the real issue is, is how Joel died. There's a big difference there, and I do believe that, for the most part, people who didn't like Joel's death are in the didn't like how it happened camp. Druckmann wanted a mix of shock value and realism. He wanted people to hate Abby, and he wanted to kickstart Ellie's journey with players frothing at the mouth to get revenge. For whatever my opinion is worth, I have a sinking feeling that the writers had no clue how to get this game started. They knew that they needed us to hate Abby, and that Ellie needed to leave Jackson in search for her. The connection between Abby and Ellie was always going to center around Joel, but I get the impression that they couldn't think of a way to implement that connection. They wanted the focus to be primarily on Ellie and Abby, which made Joel expendable. To me, it seems like that was all the thought that was put into Joel's death. They turned his character into nothing more than a plot convenience and a poor attempt at shock value and a way to show us that not everyone gets a hero's death in this world. There's a saying that a hero is just a villain to the other side, and that saying defines Joel's character. Look at the main antagonists he faced in part one. David and the cannibals are an enemy. The hunters in Pittsburgh are enemies. Robert and his men are all enemies. Those groups check all the boxes for a cliche, evil villain role, all while trying to stop Joel's progress in the game. Clearly villains. Well, David had a huge organized camp he provided for, and even though we don't see them, he does state that he has women and children he looks after as well. He also states that a crazy man and a little girl slaughtered a lot of his men. To David and his group, Joel and Ellie are the villains. Throughout the Pittsburgh level, NPCs are overheard talking about a guy and a little kid who keep killing everyone. Joel used to be a hunter himself, he never saw himself as a bad guy when he was a hunter. Tommy says he has nightmares from those days, and Tess calls them both shitty people. But to Joel, it was just a way to survive. No hard feelings. Those Pittsburgh hunters don't see themselves as villains, but they see Joel and Ellie as two tourists killing all their group. A lot of people forget that Robert hired men to attack Tess because Joel and Tess were out to get him first. Robert reacted because Joel and Tess became his enemies. Now I bring all this up because the ending to Joel's story in part 1, it's up to the player to decide whether Joel is actually a hero or a villain. Before Joel started to bond with Ellie, the only reason he continued his mission of getting her to the Fireflies was because it was Tess's dying wish. That sounds pretty heroic. In the end, did he risk everything to save Ellie's life? Or did he slaughter the group that was trying to save the human race? It's up to the player to decide based on their own experience. The Last of Us was already an amazing game, but that ending sequence and how the player perceives it was what truly solidified it as an all-time great. Well, The Last of Us Part 2 negates and ruins that player perception. It's all but spelled out that Joel has always been the villain. Despite the whole point being Ellie's revenge against his killers, she doesn't even really say anything good about Joel the entire game. It's the opposite, really. Except for saying Joel would avenge her or Tommy, which Tommy tries to argue against, Essentially, everything else she says in the present time about Joel is reminding the player how he was a dangerous murderer that ruined humanity's chance at a cure. At the start of the Seattle chapter, when Dina asks who could have killed him, Ellie replies that Joel crossed a lot of people over the years and changes the subject. Like, I'm not saying retcon Joel being a murderer, but it makes Ellie's revenge quest seem a little weird when they're out to get vengeance for a person who they don't even seem to have fond memories of. It's only in flashbacks that we get to see Joel being a good person, but each flashback also ends with a reminder of his lie to Ellie. But we also get to have Ellie remind us how awesome she thought the Fireflies were, too. Really, the only good memories of Joel are in the player's head, creating even more of a disconnect between said players and the game's story. A few lines here or there from Ellie about how Joel kept her safe, or, God forbid, acknowledged that he killed the Fireflies to save her life, would have gone a very long way in terms of storytelling. Some kind of reminder why Ellie wants to go to these lengths to get revenge on his killers. Towards the end of Ellie's first scenario, we learn that they were not on talking terms for about half of the time skip. When we control Ellie again in the end of the game, why not have a flashback between her and Tommy directly after Joel's funeral? Tommy is the only other person who knows what Joel did in Utah. Ellie can talk to him about never getting a chance to forgive Joel. 
This way it puts her obsession with revenge into perspective. It's why she's been going crazy over this. Why she chose going after Abby over getting a sick Dina help or going with Jesse to look for Tommy. It would be a great scene to play before she decides to give up her comfortable life with Dina to get one more shot at Abby. Adding this doesn't ruin the ending or take anything away from her trying to reach out to Joel in their final conversation. If anything, it probably enhances it a little bit. Makes you feel sorry for the characters that they didn't try and reconcile earlier. But no, we go the whole game without any silver linings being said about Joel. If anyone played this without playing the first game, you'd spend the whole playthrough wondering why anyone gives a shit about Joel. With Abby being an ex-Firefly and daughter to the doctor that Joel kills, he's clearly a villain to her, Ellie can't say a goddamn good thing about him either, so if Joel is a villain in the eyes of the two characters we spend the whole game playing as, well, Neil Druckmann and Naughty Dog are pretty much saying Joel was a villain the whole time. Rather than look at him as this complex character that fans loved, no, they handled his death like he was nothing more than that of an average, expendable villain. It makes people become immediately defensive of the character they're nostalgic for. Since it happened so early and so abruptly in the game, it automatically turns players off in Part 2. Not just of Abby, but of the game itself. And let's be honest, The Last of Us Part 2 is not a fun game for the first couple hours. It's slow, relatively boring, and a fan-favorite character is very poorly written off. My only guess is that Neil Druckmann and the writers truly underestimated how popular of a character Joel was. In the world of The Last of Us, everyone is technically a villain. Joel, Tess, Ellie, Marlene, Bill, Henry, Tommy, all of the Fireflies, they're all killers fighting for different purposes. It just depends on how far down that rabbit hole they go. Everyone does shitty and reprehensible things. It's all up to the players to decide which of these killers and survivors they like best, and almost everyone loved Joel's character, even if they didn't agree with his actions. Killing him off in the way that they did, it makes players not just hate Abby, but hate the game right from the start. A game that, again, doesn't start off with much excitement. You can't fault people for being jaded throughout the rest of the story when this is how Joel was handled. That's the problem with going for shock value or an M. Night Shyamalan style twist. If it doesn't land, it fucking crashes and burns. This is going to be remembered as a flop of a plot twist for years to come. Killing him off wouldn't have been an issue if they didn't do it so nonchalantly, so abruptly. His death was rushed and treated like nothing more than a plot device to get the game started. Besides that, who did Naughty Dog think they were fooling? Like, Abby and Owen never say the word Firefly, but it's pretty goddamn obvious who they're looking for. For anyone who watches this, I'm honestly intrigued. Did anyone not see Abby and the Fireflies thing coming a mile away? The second Joel shared the screen with her, I knew he was dead and that it was going to be soon. They knew where Jackson was, and they were too small of a group to try and attack or invade. Owen even says as much right off the bat. There was no other logical way that situation would end when they introduced Abby and her group as right outside of Jackson. It felt predictable, rushed, and unnecessary. Build it up a little bit, or at least have Joel not go out, saving the life of the person who immediately kills him. Remember when Joel sniffed out the Pittsburgh ambush? How he always had a shoot-first, ask-questions-later attitude? Just overall being a person who adapted perfectly to the post-Cordyceps world? Yeah, apparently Joel forgot about all those traits when he met Abby's group too. Replay the opening Boston mission from the first game. Naughty Dog had everyone from NPCs on the street to Robert and his men openly scared of Joel. Hey asshole, what are you looking at? Ronnie, shut the fuck up! Hey Joel, we're not looking for trouble, okay? No harm, no foul. <sighs> More of Robert's guys. How do you know they're coming? Two of our guys died trying to take Tess out. I guarantee that she and Joel are on their way here right now to get Robert. Jesus. We shouldn't have taken this job. Good. Let's do another once over and then head out. It's getting close to curfew. What about Robert? Who's he holding up with tonight? He's too paranoid to stay here by himself. Fuck if I know. We'll check in with the others and come up with something. We should have brought more people. They just slow us down. Yeah, you're right. I get it. The argument is that him and Tommy have been kind of spoiled in Jackson the last couple years. But come on. They walk blindly into an ambush. Not only that, but give their real names, where they live, and Tommy even says they should come restock before leaving. 
He does all this within about 20 seconds of meeting the group. Throughout the entirety of these two games, we have fought against so many bandits and plunderers. Joel and Tommy were those ambush hunters themselves before. The decision to have them just openly divulge information and be so off guard is extremely lazy writing that doesn't fit either of their characters. Tommy might be friendlier than Joel, but we've seen in both parts 1 and 2 just how cautious he and Maria can be towards strangers. For fuck's sake, about 4 minutes after Abby takes the final swing on Joel, Tommy's argument against sending men out is what if we get hit by hunters again. I don't think he's referencing the fight from over four years ago in part one, when the town was much smaller and had no electricity. This is a direct reference that Tommy is aware of people with shitty intentions coming through. So why do Abby and her group get a pass? Because the plot needed it, and that's the only reason why. Having Tommy shaking hands, talking shop, and leaning on a table, while Joel walks dead center into the middle of an unknown group without a care in the world is lazy fucking writing and discrediting their own established characters. Hell, does it look like Tommy and Joel have gotten soft? What the fuck happened here? Tommy did this. This? No way. That was definitely him. He's one of the ones that killed Joel. There's another one over here. Shit. This sniper's a fucking bro. What? Stay low. He killed my whole fucking team. Uh, Screw it. Let's go. Uh, 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 They made those established characters bend their own traits and personalities to conveniently fit plot points that they otherwise didn't know how to incorporate in the story. Remember in Game of Thrones when everyone, including Peter Dinklage himself, kept saying Tyrion got really dumb all of a sudden after he left King's Landing? It's because they needed a smart and cunning character to fit into dumb plot points to achieve a larger, overarching narrative. That's about what happened to Joel. It's shit writing by people who are supposed to be some of the best in the industry. To me, it seemed like they flat out didn't care about Joel's character anymore. They just wanted to move on, and he turned into nothing more than a plot convenience to create 20-some hours of tension between Ellie and Abby. Once you beat the game and get to see all the interactions between Joel and Ellie, it makes far less sense that Joel would even try to save Abby in the first place. Joel risking his life for a complete stranger who's about to get swarmed is already a 50-50 debate. Risking everything, literally only a few hours after Ellie says she'd like to reconnect with him? I don't like those odds. Joel is a selfish character. It's arguably his most defining trait. If some unlucky girl gets between himself and a massive horde of infected, everything we've seen out of him says that he'd see it as nothing more than a way to buy himself more time. Don't forget that Ellie is also out on a real patrol too. An idea that both Jesse and Ellie tell us Joel has argued for a long time. The only things on Joel's mind would be escaping safely with Tommy, and then making sure Ellie was safe from the same horde. We have never seen anything from Joel's character to suggest otherwise. Oh yeah, don't expect that horde of infected to be remembered or brought up at all. Once it serves its purpose of getting Abby and Joel together, it's gone forever. Seeing as how Tommy was hesitant to immediately go after Abby and her group, saying we can't spare anyone or travel too far because there's a huge horde of infected still out there, could have been a pretty good argument. Nope, forget about the horde. They just packed up and drove away like they were hired as extras. I could go on about how poorly they wrote Joel's death, but let's just continue. The next obvious issue is really Abby in general. She is the new poster child for how to ruin a character, and there's a lot to pick apart that they could have done better with her. I have no problem at all with Abby's appearance and being so muscular. What I have a problem with is that they were too lazy to make any other characters her size. 
before you get all pissy over that statement, just think about it and hear me out. Her arms, legs, back, it's all bigger than any other character model across both games. The big sledgehammer tank enemies are designed more chunky than jacked. Garrett from the Rattlers says Abby has arms like his, but he's definitely closer to those chunky sledgehammer enemy models than he is to Abby's. Even the big dude with the sliced face at the end is just taller than her. People can say it's being sexist or bigoted or fearing strong women, but it's mostly anatomy and human biology. Clearly the world of The Last of Us is a work of fiction, but they have tried to keep it as grounded in reality as much as the story allows. Abby having that much more muscle than everyone else is biologically unrealistic. The combat draws further attention when she's killing people with one punch and snapping necks like you're playing as hunk in Resident Evil 4 Mercenaries. It's been established that the player isn't supposed to like Abby at the start, but we are supposed to sympathize with her by the end of her arc. The problem is, Abby is so unlikable at the beginning of her arc that she's forever known for two things, her muscles and killing Joel. Her physique is the very first thing players notice about her, and because Joel is killed so quickly after her introduction, players just associate a jacked girl with Joel's death. So every time we see her pulling a Saitama on an enemy or having her biceps popping out, we aren't thinking, oh, she trained so hard for this. I can't wait to see her perspective. We're thinking, ah, fuck her. She killed Joel. Here's where there's two very different sides to this argument, though. That last part is pretty easy to misinterpret. Hearing it, you'd think I'm implying that Abby should be smaller. While, yes, my point stands that Abby is more muscular than all the other character models, she's really not overly muscular. She's not as comically large as the internet memes would have you believe. Now, there is a very, very simple solution to all these problems. Make a couple other character models have a similar build as her, male and female. Have other WLF members given the same build. Have that tall dude at the end that I just mentioned be more jacked than her instead of just taller. When almost every other character looks the same, you can't help but notice her biceps being big enough that they're popping out of long sleeve shirts, let alone her usual sleeveless top. Her size compared to everyone else makes her such an easy target for people to roll their eyes and say, oh great, they wanted to create a strong female character, so they literally just made a strong female character. If they added in a handful of NPCs or enemies scattered in with the same build, then it actually helps her out. Something as easy as putting a similarly jacked guy in the burrito line with an optional conversation about them working out together. In a fictional world that has tried to keep as many realistic elements around as the story allows, Abby's character model just makes it too easy for people to complain about. It's Naughty Dog being lazy with their character design and world building. That's the real problem with Abby's appearance. In a weird way, it actually has nothing to do with her and everything to do with the other characters. We repeatedly hear about how massive the WLF is and see others using this huge gym. We're supposed to believe that Abby and Abby alone has been able to put on that kind of muscle? Are we supposed to believe that she's the only person who trains this hard? It's also inconsistent. Sometimes she looks pretty damn big, and other times she looks pretty average. Which again, just makes the times she looks pretty damn big bother players even more. We live in a day and age where more and more women are actually working out, not just staying in shape. It's not that uncommon to see girls with some muscle tone. Yes, Abby would be big and strong for a woman in the real world, but it's not completely unrealistic. Everyone else, male and female alike, being noticeably smaller than her is the actual unrealistic part. As I said before, killing Joel and her appearance are the two things Abby is most known for, so I wanted to cover those topics first. On to what I believe is the much more important subject, and that's how badly the writers portray her personality at times. I feel like people are chasing the wrong demons when they talk about not liking Abby as a character. That whole last portion of the video about her appearance, that doesn't make her unlikable. It just adds fuel to the fire of a very poorly written character. If she was more likable by the end of the game, no one would give a shit what her arms look like. So right off the bat, we're shown that she is hung up on Owen. Now, Owen is a bland douchebag, and his whole reason for existing in this game is to have Mel and Abby fawn over him. I guess he's supposed to be kinda the nice guy, too, even though he seems more worried about just getting his dick wet most of the time. They could've had Abby actually look like a strong-willed character who was dumped and hurt by Owen, but got herself through it. Could've even had her turn down advances from him, and remind him that he chose Mel instead, and has a kid on the way with her. 
That's what a strong, self-respecting, and independent adult would do. But no, that's something male or female players could relate with, and would have really helped gradually change the player's hatred of Abby. So fuck that idea, right? Instead, she shows jealousy over and over again towards Owen, awkwardly bangs him in the fastest argument to make up sex in the world, then immediately gets mad again because Owen's pregnant girlfriend is still in the picture. In a world where people turn a blind eye to violence and murder, cheating, constant jealousy, and just flat out doing dumb things for a person who left you, like, two years ago, aren't exactly likable qualities to portray either. Watch this scene between Abby and Mel, which is then immediately followed up by Abby and Yara. Don't forget, this is at a point in the game where we're supposed to be warming up to Abby and seeing her point of view. Owen invited them to come to Santa Barbara. That is very Owen. I figured you'd have talked him out of going by now. Actually, I'm going with them. But not if you come. What? He may fall for your little act with these kids, but I don't. There's nothing to fall for. Isaac's top scar killer suddenly had a change of heart. Nothing to do with Owen, right? I haven't always done the right thing. You're a piece of shit! Abby. You always have been. I'm done with you. You want to do right by these kids? Get out of their lives before you screw them over, too. Perfect. Mel's wrong, you know. You're a good person. You don't know me. I know enough. Inconsistencies like this are why the majority of players never change their opinions on Abby throughout her story arc. Abby is a killing machine that Isaac trusts as essentially a general in the WLF. Mel is a very small and very pregnant medic. Mel standing up to Abby and calling her out on being a shitty person makes Mel look like the brave character. Again, this is just bad writing, and the fact that Mel needs to address this only makes Abby seem that much more selfish and unaware of anyone's feelings except her own. Mel's statement leaves Abby crying, frustrated, jealous, and completely looking like that shitty person she was just called. She doesn't react like an adult, she reacts like a child who's only upset because they got caught doing something wrong. Then directly after this, Abby just wipes her eyes and switches gears into helping two exiled former enemies while looking through stuffed animals and playing with the dog. What the fuck kind of inconsistent writing is this? Because Yara says, oh, I've seen enough of you to know you're a good person, we're supposed to believe it? She's known Yara for like a day and a half. She's known Mel for years. Known her long enough that she says Mel was her father's best student. About seven to eight minutes apart. We see Mel call Abby a piece of shit, and then Yara call her a good person. Who of those two do you think has the more educated opinion of Abby's character? Once again, it's the writers being completely oblivious to how unlikable they have written Abby. It's the main difference between Joel being a liked selfish murderer, and Abby being a disliked selfish murderer. Joel is 100% unapologetic in his actions. He is who he is, literally down to his very last scene when he tells Ellie he'd never let her die on that operating table, even if she hates him for it. During that conversation, his tone and body language starts off as nervous and apprehensive. When he tells Ellie that he wouldn't change a thing, he immediately becomes more stern. He stands straight up, looks Ellie in the eyes, and says it with a much deeper, more defiant tone. Even in the flashback where Ellie first starts to question his lie, Joel does the same thing. He gets a much more serious tone and basically intimidates Ellie into dropping the subject. For better or worse, Joel knows who he is and stands behind his choices. His crimes have always been for self-preservation and the preservation of the people he cares about. Joel's thinking is an animalistic, kill-or-be-killed mentality. Joel knows that he's made plenty of enemies throughout his life. 
It's why he doesn't give in to Abby's guessing game and tells the Utah crew to just kill him and get it over with. He knows something he did in his past has finally caught up with him. The whole reason he lies to Ellie is because he's still aware that his actions would cause her to hate him. Abby, on the other side, has no self-awareness or consistency to her character. Abby shows legitimate tendencies of a sociopath. If she feels she has been wronged or taken advantage of, or really like a little kid that just doesn't get what she wants, then her violence towards people or homewrecking of Owen and Mel is completely justified in her brain. There's no empathy or remorse. It's the opposite. There's sometimes a very clear pleasure in what she's doing, and she's really good at playing the victim card, too. There's never another point of view except hers, which is ironic because she's a character who was created to give us multiple point of views. It's why she cries when Mel finally calls her a piece of shit instead of just going full-blown angry Abby. She's never actually thought she was a shitty person before. She doesn't give a fuck about anyone except herself. Like I said, where Joel isn't that different on the surface, he's at least self-aware and unapologetic about it. He's never shown to enjoy it and he knows there's a cause and effect to his actions. He clearly feels terrible about lying to Ellie but accepts her eventually hating him because the end result kept her alive. When Joel tortures people in part one, he picks two people that were already trying to kill him and Ellie. When he gets the information he needs, he immediately ends it by killing the two men and doesn't drag out the process. Once he and Tess get the information they need from Robert, they kill him. For Joel, it's like going to work. It's a means to an end. Abby, on the other hand, takes pleasure in torturing Joel, takes pleasure in watching Ellie plead for his life. It's only when Owen steps in and tells her, hey, reinforcements are likely on the way, end it, that she begrudgingly kills him. Jesus Christ, she beats him long enough that she builds up a sweat and has to take off her jackets. And this is a person who just saved her life while offering supplies and shelter. Abby is a murderer just like Joel, but there wasn't a split second where she even thought, maybe this guy isn't a complete monster or killed for specific reasons like I have. Maybe I should just end this. Make it quick and get out of here. Not to mention that she's blindsided by Ellie wanting her own revenge later on. Despite Ellie crying out and screaming that she was going to kill her, Abby can't believe that she actually tried. When it comes to a head in the theater, Abby cries about how Ellie killed her friends and acts like letting her and Tommy live was a Christmas present. It blows her mind that Ellie wasn't grateful they only killed Joel. How fucking narcissistic is that in this apocalyptic future? Even in that tense moment, she's trying to manipulate the situation and very clearly views herself as better than them. Abby believes her revenge was a holy war that should never be questioned. She just has this smug self-righteousness about herself. Take Ellie as another comparison. She's visibly shaken and says she's going to throw up after she kills her first human in part one. She's no stranger to violence at this point in her life either. She doesn't want to kill Abby's friends and breaks down when she realizes Mel was pregnant. After everything Ellie has done, she trembles for hours after torturing Nora for information. Abby, on the other side, says good and smiles when she's about to slit a pregnant Dina's throat. These aren't things that make her badass or cool or tough. They make her look jealous, selfish, narcissistic, and kind of have a god complex. But most importantly, they just make her flat out unlikable compared to the other characters that we already know and already care about. Before anyone says it, yes, Ellie is selfish at the very end of the game, but by then, it's the very end and we've already known Ellie for two games and a DLC package. The majority of players want Abby dead too, so it's much easier to look past. It's not the same thing at all. Oh yeah, while we're on that subject, who thought having us control Abby while we're forced to beat the shit out of Ellie was a good idea? You have no clue how much I was hoping that if you lost to Ellie, that Abby actually died, or that this fight would turn into one where you couldn't win and Ellie always came out the victor. But nope, we watch an unlikable character we're forced to play as beat the living shit out of another character we actually like, a character that we thought we were playing as the whole time because the creator of the game even told us as much. Bear with me for a minute here. While Red Dead Redemption 2 is still fresh in everyone's minds, don't forget that Red Dead 1 is still an amazing game as well. And I guess this would be spoilers for Red Dead 1 if you haven't played that yet, just skip ahead about a minute. I bring up Red Dead 1 because John Marston is kinda like Joel in a sense. Both were ex-murderers and robbers whose past came back to haunt them after they tried to settle down with their families. Joel is killed in front of Ellie and Tommy, while John is gunned down with his wife and son still on the ranch. 
Do you think it ever crossed Rockstar's mind to have us play as someone in the US military or as Agent Edgar Ross towards the end of Red Dead Redemption? Unsurprisingly, I don't know anyone who's worked at Rockstar, but I feel confident enough to answer for them and say, no. They never thought it would be a good idea to have us control the person responsible for John Marston's death. Who wouldn't want to play as Edgar Ross for 10 hours and eventually kill John Marston? Ross is a government agent and we find out his old partner was killed by John's gang. He has motivation to do it. Maybe we can see it from his point of view. Doesn't sound too enjoyable to play, does it? <sighs> like, they just did such a shit job with Abby. Not to mention that her whole quest for medicine, which is a huge chunk of her scenario, ends up being pointless because Yara dies almost immediately after. Try this alternate scenario. Yara dies from the infection, and with no one else to turn to, Lev has to trust Abby, Owen, and Mel. He opens up to Abby about being transgender, and this stirs up the memories of his mother. Lev is the one who tells Abby about all this, and still decides to go try and save her. Abby, who now actually has reason to feel more of a connection with Lev, decides to go and save him. Not a whole lot would really change except for the runtime of her campaign. Like, Abby's not even that nice to Yara and Lev, but for seemingly no reason, decides to help them. Lev clearly even tries to talk to Abby about being transgender, but instead of lending an ear, she just answers his question with another question, and lets Lev walk away all sad. Did you hear what they called me? Yeah. Do you want to ask me about it? Do you want me to ask you about it? No. Okay. We'll circle back to Abby's scenario later on when we talk about other characters, but for now, let's move on to Ellie and her traveling companions. Remember the quirky, foul-mouthed, kind of obnoxious Ellie from part one? Yeah, she's gone. It makes sense thematically that she's gone, but it doesn't help this game. Obviously, she's upset about Joel, she's a few years older, and her revenge trip isn't exactly a vacation. It makes sense that she's not the same character we remember. But all that also makes playing her kind of feel bland. With the exception of the museum flashback and her first scene on the farm, she doesn't really have much of a personality. If you didn't know her from Part 1 or the Left Behind DLC, you'd probably be pretty confused as to why people cared about her that much. Having Dina around doesn't help things out either. Not that Dina was a bad character, she's just kind of boring too. They tend to spend most of their time doing this half-whisper, quiet-talk thing with each other, and because they say, you're my favorite, or you're cute, every once in a while I'm supposed to imagine them as this true love? A week before the game started, Dina was banging Jesse. Then six days later, she's in love with Ellie, and it's magical? That's what 99% of the world likes to call a rebound. It would have made way more sense for Ellie and Dina to already be together at the start of the game. This way there was some kind of history, something at stake. Maybe they broke up for a little bit and Dina banged Jesse and still got pregnant. Now that's some kind of tension and substance to Ellie and Dina working out their relationship instead of just being boring together. By the way, if they ever reminisce about their anniversary, knowing that Joel was simultaneously being beaten to death a mile down the road is a pretty cool memory to share. A beating that they could have potentially stopped, but even in the apocalypse, teenagers make stupid fucking decisions. Pay attention to these clips. See if you can't figure out which ones don't quite fit. Hey, is Joel up? He's got reports of infected out north. We sent him and Tommy out early to scout. That sucks. Yep. Can't imagine they got much sleep. When you go out, I want you to trade off with Tommy and Joel. Those boys have been up for far too long. Where do I meet them? If you go up to the Northwest Lookout, they're scheduled to arrive later today. But watch yourself. There's too many sightings of infected recently. Of course. Be safe. Thanks. You run into anything you can't handle, you come back. Be smart about it. I'm gonna guess this bong was Eugene's. Mine. He gave it to me. You have any on you? It's patrol, you know. We're here to kill infected, not to look fancy. How many do you think it would take to bring down a moose? <laughs> More than one. Yeah. Man, the guys are not gonna believe our numbers. This 
Sounds good. I mean, gonna be stuck here a while, right? Ellie finally gets her chance on a big patrol, and a half hour into it, she's wondering if Dina has any weed. Like most people, I was a big stoner when I was younger, but I don't think I would have been quick to get high if I knew crazy mushroom monsters might attack at any minute, and my reflexes mattered not only for my life, but the life of the person that I'm with. You know, the person that we're supposed to recognize as the soon-to-be love of Ellie's life and doesn't have the same immunities to the cordyceps virus if shit does hit the fan. Before she leaves, Ellie is told Joel and Tommy barely got any sleep because they were sent out early. Then Maria says to be careful because the number of infected have been growing. Jesse then once again reminds them to be smart out there. I can't think of a better time to have your characters want to get stoned. Okay, so there's the blizzard. They assume they'll be stuck there for a while, so they get high. Once again though, Ellie wanted to get high before the blizzard hit. So while they get high and fool around, enough time has passed that the blizzard has slowed down, Jesse waited an hour for Joel and Tommy, and then still had some time left over to search their route a little bit. He also left after he sent everyone out on their patrols, so he needed to catch up to Dina and Ellie while he was out in that same blizzard. Basically they got high and blew off their responsibilities for a long fucking time. When Jesse gets mad and reminds them that people's lives are at stake on these patrols, Dina's first reaction is to yell back and say, why aren't you with the lookout? Basically pulls the poor attempt at an I know you are, but what am I little kid argument. How good is post-apocalyptic weed that all this seemed like a good idea to Ellie and Dina? Can't forget to mention how Ellie tells Dina about her immunity during all this. Like, they established that Ellie was dating someone before Dina. Did Ellie immediately fill her in too? But seriously, you're telling me the precursor to Joel's torture was Ellie and Dina getting high instead of watching for when they could resume their patrol? Aren't these characters supposed to be expert survivors and have been killing infected and humans for years? Is that supposed to be a, hey, they're still teenagers, kind of relatable moment? Because I feel like modern day tropes of teenagers getting high and blowing off their part-time jobs doesn't quite fit into the life and death world of The Last of Us. I mean, Christ. I was waiting to see a fucking legalize it poster in the background, or one of the two was going to mention how I can't believe smoking weed would get you in trouble before the virus. I don't know, maybe I'm letting that part bother me way too much, but it seemed like a very unnecessary thing to add to the story. It's just one of many examples of the characters doing something stupid, seemingly for the sake of just doing something stupid. So this seems like as good of a place as any to add this while I'm just kind of ranting. Did anyone else roll their eyes and say, are you fucking kidding me? That's the song they picked when they realized that Ellie was playing AHA's Take On Me for Dina in the music store? This is supposed to be a sentimental, touching moment between the two, and the best song they could think to have her play was Take On Me? Honestly, I had to put the game down for the day after that. Instead of thinking, oh, what a nice moment for those two, and she did learn to play guitar from Joel, All I'm thinking of is the Family Guy skit where Chris dances with AHA in the hand-drawn video and falls out of the dairy aisle because guys with leather helmets and wrenches are chasing them. I'm not an expert on early 80s pop, but I'm not aware of any hidden messages or meanings behind that song. It's such a weird fucking choice in that moment and immediately took my mind everywhere else but the game. That stupid part left enough of a lasting image in my head that at the very end of the game I started laughing to myself because I half expected them to have Ellie start singing Hello Darkness, My Old Friend during the guitar scene. Again, maybe it's just bothering me way too much, but it's such an odd song choice for the tone of the game so far. I had to get that out, but back to Ellie and Dina. All of their back and forths and time together kind of felt forced to me. I didn't think the characters had much chemistry together, let alone chemistry as an on-screen couple. Ellie and Jesse felt like two friends together. Abby and Manny felt like two friends together. Isaac felt like Abby and Manny's superior. Tommy and Ellie felt like they've grown closer over the years. Abby and Mel felt awkward together. Hell, even the like five lines that Seth has with Ellie, he actually felt like a stereotypical, afraid of change, angry old white guy that was giving a half-assed apology he didn't believe in. Ellie and Dina just didn't have that same kind of communication. I love Ellie's character, but her and Dina just didn't mesh well. The only scene between them that was really memorable in a good way for me was when Dina realizes that Ellie's mask is broke and the two freak out. But that scene has everything to do with good acting more so than good writing, so it kinda doesn't count. 
I felt like half their dialogue together wasn't even conversations. Like, they were just saying statements to each other, and the other half of them were just kind of awkward. Next, I need to talk about Tommy real quick. He is basically the Last of Us version of Harvey Dent from The Dark Knight. You either die a hero or live long enough to become the villain. But it's not Joel's death or even really Abby that pushes Tommy to his darker side. It's Ellie. She inadvertently plays the role of Heath Ledger's Joker in turning Tommy into the worst version of himself that he can be. Initially, Tommy wants to assess the situation a little bit to avoid any further deaths, even if that means letting Abby and her group go. He isn't happy about it, but he accepts the reality of their world, the reality of Joel's actions over the years, and that Ellie and himself are lucky to still be alive. Ellie, on the other hand, needs to immediately go after the Salt Lake crew with reckless abandon. This causes Tommy to go out on his own and hunt down the group in an attempt to keep Ellie safe in Jackson, going so far as to request that Maria lock up Ellie to protect her from herself. Tommy rushing out to find Joel's killers is more about Ellie than it is Joel, and this is something that goes completely over Ellie's head. Her obsession with revenge never lets her take a step back and recognize that Tommy is doing this so she doesn't have to. All she can blindly think is how stupid Tommy was for leaving without her. In part one, Ellie and Tommy have very little interaction, if any now that I think about it. We see through a flashback that Ellie and Tommy have become closer, and that she doesn't hold any ill feelings towards him as she starts to mistrust Joel. Like a lot of the characters in part two, their relationship is still very underdeveloped though. Is Tommy doing all this because he truly wants to keep Ellie safe, or is he trying to keep her safe out of a last respect to Joel? Likely a little of both, but it's up to the player's interpretation. Either way, it doesn't paint Ellie in a positive light. If they expand upon their relationship and show them as closer, then Ellie looks even worse than she already does by caring more about revenge than Tommy's well-being. On the other hand, what we got seems a little forced because we don't know how close Tommy and Ellie are. We're never given that context. Tommy left by himself and went to such lengths to kill Abby only hours after explaining to Ellie why it was such a bad idea to do exactly what they all ended up doing. When it comes to the two of them, it really was a double-edged sword. Like so many other parts of this game, I feel like an extra line of dialogue here or there could have helped so much. When Tommy, Ellie, and Jesse are in the theater talking about the way home, Ellie clearly isn't happy with the decision to leave, while Tommy and Jesse don't seem to take that too seriously. After Tommy asks Ellie if it's okay to let Abby live, I would have loved to have seen Tommy reinforce that he cares too. Throw in two lines where he says something like, whatever he was to you, Joel was also my older brother. This isn't about killing people anymore, it's about keeping Dina alive. Something along those lines would have had way more impact than just sternly saying, yeah, is that okay? Saying something more serious then following it up with the already awkward transition back to nice guy Tommy talking about the necklace would just flow so much better. It would make sense why he had the awkward transition. The scene we got felt empty and played off like Jesse and Tommy were too afraid to tell Ellie that they're tired of her shit. Ellie has already shown that her revenge is more important to her than Dean and Jesse and Tommy's safety. It can't really get much worse for her from a player's perspective. After the theater scene, we see Tommy become a shell of his former self. One eye is barely open and possibly blinded. He struggles to walk and Maria leaves him. Now that Ellie has seemingly moved on, all Tommy now has left is revenge. Whereas his original reason for hunting down Abby by himself was to keep Ellie safe, now it's the opposite and he's trying to ship Ellie out by herself to finish the job. By the end of the game, we don't really know how much power Tommy still has in Jackson, if any at all. What we do know is that he's become kind of a tragic character. Someone who became disgusted with the random violence of the new world and overcame that by eventually settling Jackson years later. He did this with the thought of helping people and their families while living the closest thing to a normal life that he could give them. Now he has a whole lot of nothing. No family, poor health, and potentially no power in his own city. We see Tommy have arguably the most negative arc of anyone in the game. In part one, each side character represented a different aspect of Joel's thinking and personality. Sarah's death represented the death of Joel's conscience. Tess represented Joel's fears of becoming vulnerable to his emotions again. Bill represents the future path of paranoia and lack of those emotions that Joel started going down. Henry and Sam represents the opposite side of the spectrum. An unhealthy codependence so strong that Henry panics and kills himself at the loss of his brother. Then Tommy comes along and represents what Joel didn't think was possible. A return to the closest thing to normalcy that's available in this setting. The glue to all of this is Ellie. 
Tess, Bill, Henry, Sam, Tommy, they all made it out on their own without Joel. At that point in the story, Ellie could handle herself, but not like the other characters. She still needed Joel to survive in the long run. This gives Joel his new motivation. As he always says, finding something to fight for. He lets his guard down, lets himself become vulnerable to loss again. It's selfish reasoning, but he's much more open and friendly with Ellie after Tommy's. Even tries to convince Ellie to forget the whole Firefly mission and just go live normal lives in Jackson. There's absolutely nothing that deep or thought out with the characters in part two. It's not even close. Expecting the side characters to live up to the original in this aspect isn't fair, but I did expect much better than what we were given. Now let's get into how Yar and Lev are introduced. This portion will inevitably also bring some of the Owen stuff into play and how Abby changes her thinking on which side she's fighting for. I'm about to break down how I took it, and I pray to God there's something more important or thought out here that I've missed, something that went right over my dumb fucking head. As you'll find out, my perspective was not flattering for the game or the characters at all. I'm not trying to be sarcastic here when I say this, but after you listen to how I took it, if I am flat out wrong about it, could someone explain to me what the symbolism between Abby going back for Yara and Lev was? Keep watching from my take and perspective, but if that's completely wrong, let me know. For the love of God, I hope I'm very wrong and missed something about all these events. Because they're not good. Anyway, I've done this a couple times already, so first off, let's watch the scene where Yara and Lev, quote unquote, save Abby. Yara! Where is the other apostate? Clip her wings. Demons are coming. Cut her down. She's one of them. Left. about to cut Abby's stomach open. Hell, she's already starting to bleed. The only reason Abby isn't killed is because Yara is caught and the Scar Lady gets distracted. Lev is kind of slow on the draw and Yara gets her arm smashed for it. Lev takes out one guy, Yara takes out the other, and Abby helps kill the leader lady mostly because she has a gun. Did you notice what Yara said though? It didn't start with save her or cut her down. It started with demons are coming cut her down. They weren't fucking saving her on purpose. They were saving her so they stood a better chance against the infected. It was for mutual benefit, not generosity. I didn't see any arrows flying in when Abby was about to get her stomach cut open. Pretty sure Yara didn't want to get caught and want to have her arm shattered. They helped Abby because shit was hitting the fan. Definitely a situation of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. It wasn't an intentional let's save that WLF girl situation. Also, they all but say that Abby is the best scar killer in the WLF. It makes no sense that they wouldn't know who Abby was or at least have a general idea of who she was. The whole sequence is arguably the biggest missed opportunity of the whole game. Abby keeps referencing how Yara and Lev saved her life, like they meant to do it all along. It was a happy accident because they needed Abby to help kill the infected in their way, but Abby doesn't recognize the difference. What makes it that much more of an oversight is to have Abby also not acknowledge that Joel did literally save her life. Went out of his way to save her life. I keep saying it, but yes, you are supposed to hate Abby at first. But eventually, you are supposed to see her side of things and empathize with her. 
which doesn't happen to almost all players. People would have warmed up to Abby so much more if they had a section where she remembers Joel saving her. Then have a flashback to her training harder than everyone else, having her imagining Joel as this monster, this guy who mowed down countless fireflies. He killed their leader Marlene, he killed her dad and all the armored guards with automatic rifles protecting the surgical room. Show her constantly pushing herself to be better because she created this image of a devil in human skin, but then he turns out to just be a guy in his 50s that used some of his last breaths to save her life. If you want the final narrative to be revenge is bad and you need to let go of hate, what better way for Abby to experience those emotions than by having her actually second guess if hunting down Joel was the right thing to do? Maybe questioning herself about torturing Joel is what drives Abby to go back and save Yara and Lev. Because what we got was way, way worse. Let's start from the beginning of that. People always mention the flashback with Owen where she mentions going back to training rather than hooking up with him. Once again, pay attention to what they're saying. We can't miss training. Really? Not even just for one night? No. Nope. Talk about it. It's getting late. Owen, we have to go back. We will. Once you see this. Owen. What are they going to do? Kick out a bunch of displaced fireflies who have nowhere else to go? Maybe. I don't want to find out. Just come see this thing. We have to come back here with the others. That's good, yeah. Get them to break the rules, too. You don't think it's worth it? Let's see how much trouble we're in when we get back. Come on, Ab. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. Talk to me. I know all the leads have dried up. Joel's still out there, you know? I know. What can I do? Let's go back. We can still make training. <laughs> you go ahead. What about you? the seals for a little while. She's talking about it as mandatory training. Not as her working harder than anyone else. Really, the only person she's working harder than in this flashback is Owen. She talks about getting in trouble with Isaac for not being there. That's not going the extra mile to be the strongest, most dangerous person in the WLF. That's doing the exact same amount of work as everyone in the WLF, except Owen. That scene also paints Owen in such a negative light, too. It makes no sense why Abby is stuck on him, like, three years later. If he said, Okay, Abby, you're right. Let's go to training. She probably would've hooked up with him afterwards. But instead, we're supposed to give a shit about Owen when he throws a blue balls hissy fit and stays behind because Abby wants to go to mandatory training? For a game that visually has so much attention to detail, they missed so many story elements that are just blatantly fucking stupid or flat out have backwards logic. Speaking of Abby training to avenge her dad, he's the only doctor in the known world who can perform brain surgery, yet Abby says how he always runs off alone into that part of the woods. Does that also seem kinda stupid to anyone else? Shouldn't he be more focused on teaching some of his skills and procedures, or at least not running outside by himself? Kinda like when Joel yells at Ellie for running off and not realizing how important her life is. He might be an actual brain surgeon, but he also tried to intimidate Joel with only a scalpel, and frequently runs off by himself in the woods under the hope that Infected haven't moved further in. We're supposed to feel bad for this idiot? The best doctor in the world's life isn't really on par with saving a zebra. 
I guess they were trying to mimic the Jurassic Park scene, I mean, giraffe scene, from part one, to try and give Abby a little shine when they know that no one wants to play as her. But instead, the whole thing just made me think Jerry was an asshole. I kind of got off topic with asshole Jerry. This is about the introduction of Yara and Lev, but now let's include Owen because it all kind of ties together. Let's get the sex scene out of the way because Jesus Christ is there so much bad dialogue here. Dialogue that just goes against the whole plot. Dialogue that I don't know how the people writing the script didn't question how poorly it turned out. So, Owen feels bad about killing a Scar who didn't fight back after being hit in the head. Owen stresses how hard he hit the guy in the head. It was probably the concussion or brain trauma talking when the guy didn't reach for his weapon and looked up at Owen oddly. If Owen shot him in the leg or something and the Scar didn't fight back, that would make way more sense in this particular part of the story. This old, now brain damaged Scar is Owen's realization that he's fighting a war he doesn't care about. Fair enough. Giving the guy in the story a terrible head injury before Owen has this realization is a weird choice, but fair enough. Whatever. Owen then says he's going to follow a rumor about a Firefly camp in Santa Barbara. Abby tells Owen that the Fireflies are gone, that she doesn't need that group anymore, and he needs to grow up because he's following dead leads. This prompts Owen to sarcastically say he's got to see it through, because Abby kept saying that about the leads in Looking for Joel. Because, you know, once again, Abby's search for Joel was her holy war, and anyone else who wants to follow their own thing is just wrong. Abby asks about Mel, and gets mad when Owen says he's leaving her behind. She tells Owen to grow up, and that she'd run the other direction if the Fireflies were still around. Owen tells her that she's hiding the same feelings about the WLF and the Fireflies, and reminds her that she's kind of being a hypocritical bitch right now by using the torture of Joel as an example. This prompts Abby to jack up Owen into a wall, and after a couple seconds scuffle, they start to immediately have sex. What? So Abby disagreed with everything Owen said until he pulled her hair. First in self-defense, and secondly when he's drunkenly plowing her. Abby then decides that maybe she should go check in on Yara and Lev, even though they're scars. When she returns, Abby gets mad that Mel shows up, and Owen decides to stay with her. And then Abby ends the game searching for the Fireflies off of Owen's lead. All of those things are the exact opposite of what she believed before getting bent over a table by a drunk guy. There's no non-sarcastic, not condescending way to address these changes in Abby's character. She fucks a drunk Owen, who still doesn't really seem to care about her anywhere near as much as she does him, and that's what prompts the biggest change in her character's thinking? Getting fucked by a drunk guy who has a baby coming with another girl? 10 out of 10. It's a masterpiece. Fuck you. Remember when I suggested earlier that Abby should remember killing Joel and have regrets about how it happened? That he was just some old guy and wasn't this monster she'd always envisioned? And I would have had those memories be what led her to thinking that maybe Yara and Lev weren't monsters either? Nope. Abby fucked a drunk guy that only wants her as a side piece, and now she believes what he does. What a role model and strong female lead that Abby is. People were so worried about the imaginary SJW agenda of this game, but after playing, I can't believe that actual SJWs and feminists didn't look at Abby's character and go, what the fuck, who wrote this garbage? She's awful and not empowering in the slightest. All the issues with Abby are not just with how her character and her personality are written either. Abby's plot has zero direction after Joel's death. That's just another reason why killing Joel off so early was a mistake. She achieves her goal almost immediately in the story and is aimless after that. We go from a big cliffhanger in the theater to following Abby around her day-to-day -day life. We have nothing invested in her day-to-day -day life and know that her path is going to lead right back to that theater. Why are we supposed to care about anything in the middle? It makes everything between Joel's death and returning to the theater seem like filler and wasted time. 
It reminds me more of how they did the Left Behind DLC from Part 1. We see flashbacks of Ellie and Riley, which turned out to be a romantic relationship. We see what Ellie was doing during the time skip while Joel was recovering from his injury. And Ellie's mission in this DLC is also to get medicine and sutras Joel needs to survive the makeshift surgery that Ellie performs. Actually, that kinda sounds like Abby's scenario, doesn't it? We get flashbacks with Owen, which was her old romantic relationship. We watch what Abby is doing during the three-day time skip while we played as Ellie. And wouldn't you know it, a big chunk of Abby's playtime is looking for medicine and sutras so Yara doesn't die during her makeshift surgery. Did they even fucking try when they made this character? The answer is actually no, and it's pretty easy to back up that claim. Way back when, in the beginning of this video, remember I brought up that 2013 speech Neil Druckmann did, and said I'd bring some of it back up later on? Well, now is finally the time. To set this clip up real quick, in the original script for part 1, Tess was going to be the final antagonist. She had a brother who died in a fight that broke out in Boston. This fight was started by Joel, so as a result, Tess blamed Joel for her brother's death. This relentless force slams into the truck. Um, she's now with this whole, their old gang, and they're trying to like get revenge on Joel, and they um, surround Joel and Ellie in this ranch house. Uh, in order to escape, uh, Joel finds this, this um, air duct that only Ellie can fit through. He tells her to sneak out, steal Tess's car. I'm gonna fight them here and distract them. I'll meet you back, keep going west towards that city we've heard about, where supposedly they're trying to kind of um, restore uh, humanity or restore society. Uh, reluctantly, Ellie escapes. Uh, as Joel, you kind of have this climactic fight with your old gang, but eventually you get captured uh, by Tess. And now we see just how far Tess has come in this relationship and how she's willing to torture Joel to make him suffer. And just like she lost her brother, she wants to kill Ellie in front of him just to make him pay for that. Uh, and Joel tells her, there's nothing you could do to me. There's nothing you could cut. Uh, I've already essentially sold my soul to save this girl. And on that, we, um, uh, and as Tess is, is finishing torturing Joel, um, she realizes he's not gonna talk and she levels a gun against his head and on the gunshot, we slam to black. And then we're back with Ellie, uh, and as she's driving, she pulls off the side road and she realizes Joel was lying to her. He's not gonna get away, and she turns back. And for a second time, you're playing with Ellie. And you're sneaking into the ranch house, you're climbing up the stairs uh, where Joel is being tortured, and now you hear that conversation again where Joel was being tortured, and you realize you're back in time. Uh, and in fact, it's Ellie that bursts into the room right before Tess was gonna shoot Joel, and she ends up shooting Ellie. Sorry, she ends up shooting Tess. She doesn't shoot her. <laughs> she, she didn't shoot herself. That would have been a more, uh, a, tw a bigger twist on the end. And then Ellie and Joel kind of escape from that ranch house, and the story ends with them kind of on this precipice of San Francisco, the city that they've been hearing about. They can see electricity in the distance, um, and Joel looks at Ellie and smiles, and he's hopeful that they could have a future in this world, even without a cure. So that was a story as we pitched it, probably mid to late 2010. So, the problem that we had was Tess, I guess in some ways this was a bigger problem where um, her motivation was even harder to, to buy into. Here was Joel's old partner, and you know, to no fault of his own, her, uh, her brother died, and now she's going to go crazy and take her whole gang and pursue him across the country for a year. It's like it, she just seemed like a psycho. Like you didn't, you didn't buy into it. It just seemed kind of a weird, a weird thing that we stuck in the story just for the sake of having this antagonist. And again, every time, like but the problem with both of these things, uh, um, and why we held on to them, why I held on to them for so long is like I didn't want to let go of that ending. That ending in my mind was so cool when like you get to play Ellie a second time and save Joel. Uh, but we just approached it from all these different angles for so long, and then she was like, okay, what if we just cut that ending? What if we didn't end? Well, maybe it means that you find an idea that really resonates with you. And no matter how many times that idea fails, you stick to it because for some reason it speaks to you. And you have to keep exploring it and keep coming back to it and, and bring it to life. Or maybe it's about letting go. And it's knowing that idea will become way stronger through interpretation of people much more talented than you, whether it's actors, animators, composers, designers, programmers, a team of some of the most 
talented people in, in entertainment and but you find a core of people that you really trust that understand story and are going to call you out on your bullshit. Does that scenario sound familiar? While everyone was so up in arms about hearing Neil Druckmann talk about feminism in The Last of Us, they didn't pay attention to the fact that he created Abby with Tess's discarded plotline. Swap out Tess's brother for Abby's dad. Swap out the Fireflies for Tess and Joel's old gang. Swap out Ellie going upstairs to find Joel being tortured to making Ellie go downstairs to finding Joel being tortured. It's all too similar to be a coincidence. He even says that the whole revenge plot of chasing Joel around the country for years makes Tess seem psycho, and it was rejected, but he kept holding on to it. Well, for The Last of Us Part 2, a man named Bruce Draley had since left Naughty Dog. He was also a director on Part 1, and when he left, that basically made Neil Druckmann the final authority on the game. While Druckmann wrote the original story, he has said that many ideas came from a lot of different people. For example, a programmer gave him the idea of bringing back Marlene at the end of the game. After the departure of Bruce Straley and the massive success of Part 1, there wasn't really anyone to tell Druckmann these ideas were bad again. He didn't get the ending he wanted for Part 1, so he added a new character to replace Tess's role and switched it up just enough to be the start of Part 2 instead. Later on in that speech, he even brings up letting go of your ideas that you might be stuck on because you have to trust when your team tells you no. Well, he didn't take his own advice here. The ideas that he was told were bad for part one, he just threw right back into the sequel. This video is clearly going to be long enough in its own right, so I'm not going to bring up other aspects of that 2013 speech. But, if you've made it this far in, you give a shit about this game, and I suggest again, going and listening to that speech. After playing part two, there's a lot of things he says that now sound very familiar. Abby's scenario is also much more action-oriented than Ellie's, and I feel that was done on purpose for the reasons I stated earlier. It's a way to hide the fact that there's no real substance in her story arc. Shivs allow her to be more reckless around Infected, she can string together kills by punching her way out of encounters, and pipe bombs draw more attention than Molotovs. Just look at some of the guns they trade off. Ellie gets a bolt-action rifle, so Abby gets a semi-automatic burst rifle. Ellie has a bow and arrow, Abby gets a crossbow. Ellie gets Joel's revolver, Abby gets the much stronger hunting pistol. I could be completely wrong, but I got the impression Ellie's explosive arrows were a late addition to the game as a way to try and balance out both characters' firepower. Abby is more of a soldier, so it makes sense she'd have the better weapons, but that's also a not-so-subtle way to try and make her gameplay seem more exciting. You think of things like the Rat King, or the visions of Haven burning to the ground, and the skyscraper walkways, because they need to be there for Abby. It's a distraction from the fact that her whole gameplay scenario is kind of pointless. We've already discussed at length how poorly written her character is, so it's not like we're missing out on some great development or story. Think about it. If we didn't switch to Abby between Ellie's two parts, what information would be lost? We wouldn't know who this kid that shoots Tommy in the leg and Dina in the shoulder was. That's about it. That is the only relevant information we gain by spending half the game controlling Abby. Everything else that she does or happens to her doesn't fucking matter to the final ending sequence between Ellie and Abby. We would still get Tommy tipping us off to her whereabouts at the end, and we'd still get Garrett and the prisoners telling us where to find her because she tried to escape. After seeing Lev with her earlier, and that Abby immediately carries him to the boats, we get the obvious context clues that this kid is friends with Abby. Which means Ellie can then still use him as bait for the fight. Between her terrible character writing and lack of any important story information being told through her eyes, almost everything about her scenario ends up being unnecessary and pointless. Speaking of pointless things, holy shit did the Rattlers come off as a forced common enemy for Ellie and Abby. The Scars seem to get the worst of the encounter, but the WLF suffers huge losses during the attack as well. Without Isaac, I guess they just kinda disbanded after the invasion of the Scars Island? We don't really know. The problem with these outcomes is that there's not really anyone left for Ellie and Abby to fight. Instead we get introduced to the Rattlers when there's less than two hours of gameplay left. At first I thought introducing them might be more of a big deal. When they capture Abby, did anyone else get the feeling they knew who she was? Oh, shit. No. Catch, huh? no. 
<laughs> nope. I guess Garrett was just impressed with her neck? What the hell was the point of that weird scene? I got excited because I thought they were some sort of bounty hunters, or had members that were remnants of the WLF, that they knew who Abby was. Remember, she went from agreeing to lead the attack on Scar Island, to then mowing down WLF members in like 24 hours. These were her friends and people she fought with. The average WLF soldier knows who Abby is, but doesn't know why she turned. All they'd know is that she was responsible for Isaac's death and killing other WLF members. This would make her the traitor and killer to another group's perspective. It would come full circle and be a nice parallel to her mission against Joel from the beginning. Seeing as the ending of the game actually turns more into a forgiveness story than one of revenge could have been a cool way to wrap up Abby's arc. That could have been the reason she doesn't want to fight Ellie in the end. She realizes that ultimately, her revenge against Joel is what got her captured and tortured later down the road. Nope. Rattlers are cliche, asshole human traffickers, and Abby doesn't want to fight Ellie because she already got her ass kicked by the Rattlers. <sighs> Another fucking wasted opportunity that seems very easy to improve upon. Speaking of even more pointless things... Let's finally talk about that ending, and why it's just that. It's pointless. The end of the first game left every player questioning whether both Joel and the Fireflies were wrong or right in their choices. The thing is, we had an entire game to help sway our decisions. I knew what Joel did wasn't the right answer, but I didn't care. I liked Joel, and I didn't really like the Fireflies. That ending made you think and left you feeling unsure of your own emotions. Not to be dramatic, but it was kind of a powerful ending. The first time I beat part one, I sat in the thinker position for like 15 minutes not knowing how to feel. It was all that was on my mind for a few days afterwards, and I was far from the only one that had that reaction. It was around this time that there was this dumb debate of video games as art. Were they art like movies and TV dramas and such, or just a popular toy that glorifies violence and doesn't deserve mainstream respect? The Last of Us became the poster child for the games as art debate. It didn't fall into happily ever after cliches, the characters had realistic flaws, and the storytelling was as good as any game ever made. The ending to part 2 left people feeling empty and unsatisfied. Ellie chooses revenge over her family. Tommy loses his family, his physical health, and one of his eyes. Dina loses her friends, her girlfriend, her house, her comfy life. Joel is dead, Jesse is dead, the city of Jackson is significantly weaker now. Lev gains his freedom, but loses his sister and kills his own mother in the process. And then there's Abby once again. In the grand scheme of things, she doesn't really lose anything. She gets to live, she gets to keep her new best friend, and she gets to simply float away to go meet up with the Fireflies and recover. Let's go over some of the arguments against this. Well, she gets the shit kicked out of her and left to die on that pole. Which characters don't get the shit kicked out of them? It's kind of status quo and doesn't give her any sympathy compared to anyone else. She lost all her friends. <sighs> Were those really friends? They didn't seem all too likable themselves and outside of her ability to kill people and help them in fights, they didn't seem to like her all too much either. Except for Manny. I'll give her Manny. What about Owen? As we already talked about earlier, Owen was far from all in on his relationship with Abby. It wasn't a complete one-way street with the two of them, but Abby clearly thought more of Owen than Owen did of Abby. Let's be blunt, he dumped her before and only wanted her as a side piece for now. Other than originally planning to go to Santa Barbara by himself, Mel was never out of the picture in comparison to Abby. In the end, all she really lost was Manny. I don't think she ever finds out that characters like Nora or Jordan and his girlfriend even died. In a world where everyone has god-awful things happen to them, she gets off the easiest by far. Then because of even more plot convenience, at the very last second, Ellie decides to let her live. Dina already told Ellie that she was leaving if Ellie went back out. She just had two fingers bitten off and has so many wounds that there's no realistic way she should have survived. After the entire game's plot revolves around revenge and every action having a reaction, Ellie gives up her goal at the very last second. I get it.
There's the whole, this won't bring Joel back, and revenge will ruin everything, so let's try and forgive message at the end. But Joel is still dead, and she already lost everything. The character of Ellie is already in way too deep, and done way too much for her to let Abby live at the very end. Abby was fully planning on returning to the Fireflies, too. Are we supposed to think that the Fireflies won't come after Ellie now? Even though the game barely brings it up, Ellie is still immune and the Fireflies know this. Ellie is still a very valuable person to them. Joel's supposed to be the unlikable murderer here, but compared to Ellie and Abby, he seemingly had the right ideas from the start. Wait! Let me go! You just come after her. The world of The Last of Us is grim, unfair, and unforgiving. After everything that's happened, letting Abby live is potentially a death sentence of a mistake. Just as it was in hindsight for Abby to let both Ellie and Tommy live. Only difference is that Ellie and Tommy tracked down Abby. They had to go searching and survive long enough to find her. Abby kinda has an advantage because she knows where Ellie fucking lives. She can come back with an army of fireflies to kidnap the immune girl. By keeping Abby alive, Ellie actually lets this cycle of violence continue rather than finishing it herself, rather than figuratively and literally ending their story together. There were so many times I felt like part two was going to end, but then it just kept going. When it finally did, it didn't feel like an ending. Whereas part one felt like an ending to Joel and Ellie's story, this time around it felt inconclusive. Everyone is worse off or dead, and I get it, the whole revenge and hatred will cost you everything themes are at play here, but it's not a civilized world and we've spent two games seeing how real world values don't exist anymore. No one is without sin and even the best people have done horrible things. There's no Starks versus the Boltons, Avengers versus Thanos, Jedi versus the Dark Side, and so on. Just like Druckmann was unapologetic in having Joel lie to Ellie as the ending of the first game, he should have been unapologetic in having either Abby or Ellie die in this one, or potentially even kill each other. And I've seen a lot of people try to defend this ending by saying that the flashback of Joel isn't about forgiving Abby or even about Joel's death. It's about Ellie realizing that she's really upset because Abby took away her chance to physically forgive Joel. That doesn't change anything. So because she couldn't forgive Joel, she figures gotta forgive somebody, and lets Abby live? It still makes no sense that way and doesn't change any of the things that have already happened. There's a difference between subverting cliches and plain old bad writing. Part 1 had a very non-cliche ending that was great and didn't feel forced. Part 2's ending felt like nothing more than a contrived way to leave the door open for a Last of Us Part 3. In my opinion, there should have already been a Last of Us Part 3 teased. That's because this should have been split into two games and completed as a trilogy. After spending most of this video shitting on Abby and as backwards as this is going to sound, I will say that part two should have been only about Abby. This should have been her game. If they built up Abby's character before she killed Joel, then they easily, so fucking easily, could have had players see her logic and point of view, flesh out her story more, Show her growing up in training. Show her relationships with the other ex-Fireflies that no one gave a shit about. Let us play as her for her entire search for Joel. Give her an entire game where we have a chance to like and relate to her. If they did it this way, I think fans would really get behind her character. Instead of the boss fight against Ellie, you could have had Abby and her group finally find and corner Joel. If her friends are going to die either way, Make Joel take out a few during the fight before he's overwhelmed, or he gives himself up in exchange to save Ellie. Yes, that's cliche, but you'd be at the exact same point in the story, except Joel gets a proper send-off and fans don't hate Abby. They actually have that information to see her point of view. It could have the exact same effect as the ending of Part 1, where you really don't know which side to favor. Then in Part 3, you have Ellie go on her revenge quest. This way, we truly have fans split on which character they side with. Grow some balls and then have either Ellie or Abby die at the end of the trilogy. Hell, if you really need to play up the revenge and hatred is bad angle, let them kill each other 
and fade to black on the trilogy. That's completely fan fiction, but seems like a pretty simple and logical solution to what was made. All in all, this isn't the worst game I've ever played. Obviously I thought the story was terrible, but the combat encounters are pretty fun and the scenery is gorgeous. But those aspects shouldn't surprise anyone. They had a combat system in place from part 1, and we all know what Naughty Dog is capable of from a development standpoint. The plot just drags this game so far down. It seemed like the rough draft of a story that was never rewritten or improved upon. It's mind-blowing how bad it is at some points, or that no one else tried to step in and say that these are bad ideas. As I said in the beginning, this game was more disappointing than anything else. It's disappointing that there was all the political and real-life drama. If you didn't like Abby, then you were called sexist and afraid of playing as a female lead, but somehow those allegations all forgot that people couldn't wait for Ellie as a female lead. If you didn't like this game, it's because you're a bigot, transphobic, and can't handle diversity. <sighs> Give me a fucking break. Sometimes the issues are as cut and dry as it seems. This game plays well, but also has a really bad storyline that's surrounded by uninteresting characters, none of which has anything to do with their race, gender, or sexual identity. The other side is fucking ridiculous too. Death threats? Over this? That's fucking unnecessary and really a pussy move by keyboard warriors who don't understand the context of what they're actually saying. If you feel that strongly, don't tell voice actors you're going to stab them over Twitter. How about you hit developers where it actually hurts, the wallet, and don't buy any more Naughty Dog games. But that won't happen. Just ask EA. Because we live in a day and age where people love being unhappy and, weirdly enough, compete with each other for who can be more unhappy. Playing this game ruined your day? Well, that's what happens to you. That doesn't give you the right to tell strangers you're going to kill them. I can guarantee you The Last of Us 2 will not be the first and only time you spend money on something in life, only to be let down. It sounds really hypocritical coming from a guy that just made a really long video bashing this game's story, but I did enjoy the actual gameplay and played through the story twice already. Do I wish it lived up to expectations? Fucking of course I do but I got my $60 worth out of it. This game just really turned into a powder keg for negativity. People were at each other's throats over real-world societal issues, plot and gameplay leaks, as well as Naughty Dog as a company coming under scrutiny. And this was all before the game came out, which only got worse. For the people who loved it, cool, good for you. The people who hated it, cool, good for you. For me, I'm not going to give this a score or a rating. I'm just going to say it was all around really disappointing, and whether you agree or disagree, this video is why I thought that. They tried to catch lightning in a bottle twice, and it didn't work. The Last of Us Part 2 is a legitimate modern day tragedy story. There are no happy endings to hand out, and there isn't much hope spread throughout the world. Can a true, old school tragedy story work in today's day and age? Sure it can. But it at least needs to be a good story first. So, that's all I've got. If you made it this far, seriously, thanks for watching. Uh, whether you agree or disagree with anything I said, hopefully you enjoyed the video at least. This one took a while to make, and I hope people get some entertainment out of it. If you want to hear more video game stuff, me and my buddy Paul are giving the podcast thing a shot. It's called All Things Nonsense, and is mostly us drinking and talking about video games and TV shows. Besides here on the Swoop Goose YouTube channel, it's also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and all the other ones I'm forgetting. We're also Swoop Goose on Twitch, and we try to stream when we get the time. Thursday nights seem to be our constant, though. Paul also runs the Swoop Goose Instagram, which is at swoop underscore goose, so check that out, too. It's 2020. You guys know all about the like, comment, and subscribe stuff. Do it if you so choose. Obviously, it always helps out. One last time, thanks for watching, and hopefully see you guys back. Later. Fuck Seattle.